What's going on, guys, and welcome back. Today, we're going to be talking about red-hot cards on the rise and also ice-cold cards that are terrible and falling in today's meta. We're also going to release a little bit of steam and talk about our most hated cards in Marvel Snap, and I'm curious if mine line up with yours. We're also talking Jean Grey, the iconic X-Men, and everything you need to know about the new Control Queen. We're going to talk about all that today and more on this episode of the Snapchat. And as always, I'm joined by Mr. Alex Kocha. Happy July 10th. Happy new card acquisition week, Alex. We got ourselves the whole balance patch coming out tomorrow. How we doing, bud? I'm doing great, Cozy. Uh, this week has been absolutely phenomenal. I got to meet the literal goat. Look at this absolute boss in the middle of the screen here. Uh, I, literally a goat. I couldn't believe it. The friendliest goat I've ever talked to. Uh, this goat was one of the nicest uh, goats I've ever had an opportunity to uh, cuddle with converse with and uh, quite frankly uh, smelled horrible but was a great presence overall cozy i gotta tell you with everything that's going on right now um in marvel snap between the massive changes coming to the spotlight cash system it's an absolutely incredible time to be a marvel snap player dude where, why why were you with goats in july i don't know if the month matters but yeah, yeah. are you a petting zoo or, uh... Yeah, we took the kids to this really cool petting zoo and uh, the petting zoo, basically the, the goats walk around, they eat your clothes and they poo everywhere. And then every once in a while, one of the goats would be like, and just kind of walk up to you and it's like, looks friendly. You pet it a little bit. I, um, you'll be surprised to hear this, Alex. I have not been to a petting zoo in like, uh, in like 30 years. What, what, what do they have outside of goats? So they had goats, uh, they had chickens. The chickens were a hit with the kids because the kids could chase the chickens and the chickens would like run away and stuff and they make funny sounds. And then uh, outside of that, there's horses. My my daughter got kicked by this like mini horse. What are they called? They're, I don't know, they're called something, a not pony? a pony. It's like, it's like a miniature horse. It's even smaller than a pony. Yeah. If you could pit, pet any dangerous animal, what would you pet? If I could pet any or if I could have one? Because like, I really want an orca, not just because the card, I want an orca in my, in my living room. Kind of want a panda. Pandas are pretty cool, but it comes down like when it comes down like the best animals ever by far, it's penguins, man. Emperor penguins by far, no question. Penguins the best animal ever. Yeah, seriously, no question. What what Wait, do you why, think though? it is? What do I think the best animal ever is? Yeah, I mean, I would I would like to pet a hyena because I think that like petting a hyena is like the ultimate like kind of like yo check this out. I'm That's the best of, animal. Or is that just the, the most woods, pet right? animal? I haven't broken them down by like pet status. So I, no, like this is the most like most dangerous animal to pet, I think would be like a hyena. Cause I feel like it would just attack your arm right away. Give me like an S tier animal and an F tier animal. So like for me, S tier animal, emperor penguin, F tier animal, like a giraffe. I, I they kind of suck. You know what? I've, I've always been pretty low on elephants. They don't impress me all that much. Like what? I get they're huge. But like I would get, I wouldn't say it's an F, but I would give it like a C. Like people are like, oh, it's an elephant. Yeah. I'm like, it's an elephant. Like, okay, it's a huge ass thingy that walks really slow with a massive trunk like i get that what's an s tier, s -tier. what's the s tier ah oh, man that's hard to say i mean i kind of like squirrels you're giving an elephant a c and a squirrel an s squirrels are super cute man where's like i'm going to say an animal you just off the top of your head give me a letter grade okay gorilla oh that's a that's a b for sure i'll be a silver bat oh. Oh, silverback. Those are okay. Oh, sorry. I was a, 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 you needed an adjective for that the gorilla. An a. That's like, okay, he can punch through a tree. Yes, A. Rhino. Rhinos? C. Oh, my God. It's something about the gray animals with you. I, I'd give rhinos like a solid, like, B. Plus. Um, Lions. Okay, lions. Every time I see a lion, they're so lazy. They're just laying in the sun. They're so always like sleeping. D. Is that what? Yeah. A D? So squirrels are S. I'm like, I'm. I can't wait to know your top of the list here. Uh, tigers? Yeah, tigers are basically lions, so D. Are you just being, are you just hot, man? Are you just hot taking here? You really hate all these animals? The zoo must suck. You really hate all these animals is what you just asked me? I mean, you have like B, C, animals. D. You talked about a goat for 15 minutes and then you gave a tiger a D. Well, I mean, it's a tiger. I mean, obviously they're, like, they're very pretty animals, but I don't, I don't see them as being that friendly. Hippo. Oh, hippos are A. Because, like, I've, I've watched a hippo. Look, I, I, hippos might be S. I'll tell you why. I saw a video of a hippo literally run into a river for the sole reason to simply attack a pride of lions solo. There was, like, five lions in the water trying to, like, cross a river. And this hippo's like, nope, get the hell out of my water. It just charged at the king of the jungle. Crazy. Hippos apparently are insanely aggressive. I'm all for it. S tier. What about penguins? Where do you put penguins? Penguins are pretty cool. I like how they uh, they cuddle and they waddle and stuff. I'd give them a good A. 
I'm good at okay. I was about to end the podcast like right here. Okay, fair enough. Uh there you go. There's Alex's uh uh zoo tier list and and most of mine, pretty much all those animals are up there. I think hippos kind of suck actually controversially. What? Okay, yeah. That's the hottest dick. How, how why do hippos suck? They're just fat gray cows. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> So, Alex, uh, we, we now have Phoenix Force. I know last time we talked, we were just kind of like spitballing on how we felt it was going to do. And even in that podcast, I think we were pretty hesitant. We were like, it's kind of a time we're tell. We got excited about some interactions, and I'm, I'm excited to talk about kind of the good, the bad, the ugly. But like in a sentence, just thoughts on Phoenix Force? My primary thoughts on Phoenix Force have been that it feels kind of like cuttable. Like it almost feels like unnecessary in some of the lists. Like, do you know what I mean? I have felt like I'm like, I'm making a Phoenix Force list and like I force it. I force it in a way that it just does not have to be forced in. And I feel like I make a less uh, straightforward deck than if I just cut it. Like if I had just cut, I'm like, oh, I have a better move deck. Or if I just cut, I'm like, oh, I have a better destroy deck. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I'll go into it in more detail when we get to yours, but the ugly, I think one of them is it's a five cost. Like it, it, that cost is just, it's it's got to provide like so much value to be at that level. And so, yeah, I like it, but I also don't, I think it's going to be good in Conquest at times. It just feels a bit awkward. You know what? I feel like this card is going to be the same path as Nimrod, right? Like Nimrod was just like, bleh for a while and then now like Nimrod's legit right but and I feel like we might get more cards that complement it but at the moment yeah I don't know I there's a couple decks I have a few that I really like but uh yeah for the most part uh it, it's just it's not it's not too hot what is your opinion right now because I, I did you feel like you went against a lot more bots in the ladder right now yes I feel like I'm getting a lot of bots like way too many yeah yeah, it's been crazy, and like so I've been getting these weird swings in bot matches. Like I get bots that are so stupid, they just like stack like the left location for no reason, right? And then I get other ones that are like cheating so bad that like legitimately, I'm like they're they're gonna beat me. Like I can't do anything. Like they are pulling cards out of the ether. Like per like the deck makes no sense. Like they're hitting me with like perfect counters, and even my chat's like, what the hell is this bot doing? I've had like wild extremes of my bot experiences, but yeah, tons of bots. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest, dude. I, I kind of feel like ladder's a mess at the moment. I, I I just feel like it's a mess. I feel like it doesn't matter. I feel like infinite is way too easy at this point. And if you don't hit infinite, this isn't a dig at you, but overall, just like a consistent season after season basis, it just feels like it lost its merit a bit. Now you have conquest, which is just in my opinion, way better of a mode. I know some people don't love it, but it is, in my opinion, much more fun to do conquest. I don't know. There's something going. They need to put in leaderboards. This bot situation is super weird. I don't want to start this podcast on like a negative note. I just like, I want to know because it feels like I'm just trying to get to infinite so I can go and record my conquest and start doing videos. Like I, it just felt weird this season. I literally was just about to say exactly that. I just want to get to infinite so I can play conquest. And uh, like, I'll be honest with you. For me, conquest is where I want to spend most of my time. Like, the I know the the ranked leaderboards. I think that's a great thing that's coming up. But like for me, I, I'm probably not going to engage with it that much because like I love conquest that much. Like I love conquest. I love the style of gameplay. I love that rivalry setup with the matches. Um, and yeah, it does. Ranked is in a weird spot, but at the same time, I'm kind of glad they kind of reduced the, uh, the anxiety of having to get to infinite a little bit because it gives me more chance to get into conquest earlier and, and play, but you are right. We are getting a lot more bots. Is it, is it just because people are playing conquest? Have we split the player base or is there something matchmaking wise that's changed? Maybe they did that in preparation that they thought maybe conquest would be pulling a lot from the ladder. And then it ended up kind of not because also like. Conquest now is uh, lower wait times, all that. I think regional matchmaking is going to solve a lot of this, but they they, they got to figure out the whole bot thing, uh, is, is my opinion. And with that, let's go into our first subject, cards on the rise and cards on the fall. Now, I feel like in Conquest, kind of combo heavy decks, Alex, have a much better chance to stick out. You almost get lucky if someone doesn't have, I don't know, an Enchantress. You can play more on going cards. And that's what that that's gonna be my first one on today's list, Alex. I want to talk about my first riser in the month, and that's because of Echo and it's Wong. Now Echo is gonna stop an ongoing card's ability when it's played. So obviously Cosmo, um, you know, obviously Enchantress can still get through here, uh, which we'll get to. But I have her as one of the biggest risers this month as well. Uh, Wong, man, I think has a chance to shine. I think he's already been kind of shining. What are your thoughts on Wong? 
I think you nailed it here. I think you nailed it with both Wong and Enchantress, actually. Uh, like, they're two amazing choices because Wong's already been on the rise a little bit because I've been seeing a lot of Wong play with, uh, you know, Black Panther, Zola combinations coming out again. I don't know why, but, like, people aren't putting Cosmo in their decks anymore. I feel like I'm the only one putting Cosmo in decks still, which, I mean, wins me cubes. If you play Wong and someone snaps, you got to know what's coming next, right? But uh, I think that you're right, especially with Echo coming, which is still going to be a card that's not as achievable like it's not not everyone's gonna have echo but if you do and you pull it from a spotlight cash or you use your tokens and hell yeah wong's a massive riser well you're already gonna put like i feel like combo decks are already so focused on getting their combo off that you probably would put echo into those decks in, in a way like that's where she would fit um you know and, and enchantress i mean we're gonna have our whole time talking about Jean gray but i mean we've seen this time and time again when a new card comes out and everybody's playing it like the luke cage with high evo Dude, Enchantress is going to be everywhere. This is going to be one of the only ways to shut down uh, uh, Jean Grey. And, and so I, I think Enchantress is going to kind of come back on top, which is going to naturally make ongoing cards maybe go down a bit. Um, now, Alex, I want to hear your risers and fallers, but I thought it'd be interesting first. I'm going to just kind of spit them off to talk about the top 10 cards right now that are being played in Marvel Snap. Seen in matches. And then we're going to also talk about the top 10 least played all right i'm just going to spit them off i'll have a graphic on the screen for those that are watching now the top 10 most played cards are obviously number one is shang chi number two is america chavez three is dr doom surprisingly uh, it still has a 30-day report so that might tick off a little bit more wasp and hulk and high evo come back to back to back killmonger sunspot which used to be up the the highest spot right Wave, Kitty Pride, Nebula, and Storm. I don't even know if that was 10, probably more. So nothing too shocking there, you know, but we're not going to have any of those on our rising reports. Now in the least played top 10, or the least 10, I don't know what you would say there. The least played card in Snap, and it has been barely played, Alex. Like a thousand games, 1400 games compared to millions on the other side. Strong Guy is the lowest played card in the game right now, which I don't think is too much of a shock to us. Uh, Snow Guard, Watsu, Quake, then Hawkeye, Punisher. We're just like naming the cards that need to be brutally buffed. Rescue, which I thought was interesting. I think Rescue's kind of underplayed. Drax, Howard the Duck, Crossbones, Angel, and Baron. Any, any outliers before we go to our Rise and Fallers? I was actually just going to say, I think Rescue's a bit of an outlier. I think that card's better than people give it credit for. Um, I mean, there's so many things you can do with Prof X, but Rescue Prof X is one of the things you can do, and I'm kind of surprised people sleep on that a little bit. Um, Alex, I said Wong. We have Enchantress as a riser. Give me a couple more rising cards on your list in the month of July. I'm going to have to tell you, I'm not a huge fan of this one's rising, but it is rising. It's Spider-Man. You're seeing Spider-Man coming out in many more lockdown control lists. It's, a, it's one of the best ways to uh, counteract bounce. You're seeing some variations of Silver Surfer in the most recent uh, several days of the meta now using uh, Spider-Man instead of Sarah, which I think is a pretty cool splash. Spider-Man's been a riser, honestly, and it's uh, it got changed from a four uh, you know four cost to a five cost, and people are like, oh no, I don't know, and then Galactus got changed, but here we are, Spider-Man's still prevalent. Yeah, you know what? I don't know if I had Spider-Man on my list, but like he kind of it's it's funny that he has stayed relevant even being like a kind of a another professor x if you will do you think captain marvel may get a little bit more play because of jean gray potentially you'd hope so you'd hope so like i actually had that thought uh, she's on my buff list but i don't know what to do because if you what if you make her a five seven right you what do you do division and then you have phoenix forest like there's this weird like those three cards are tied to each other in some awkward way yeah. right and at the same time like captain marvel you can't make captain marvel too strong because then you just like it's like a literally it's a like it just wins for you card so <laughs> You know, you got to be careful with it, but uh, I'm not sure because if, if Jean Grey comes out on turn three, you're playing Captain Marvel on turn four. I mean, if unless you're filling the location, you, you still have to deal with Jean Grey. And that's why I think Enchantress was such a great call on your part because, like, it is the natural on-curve counter to Jean Grey. A card that I have that I think might be the biggest riser, and it's so funny, man. If we were to talk about this a couple months ago, dude, Shadow King, it is crazy to see... How many cards, even with uh, Phoenix Force, we have multiple man. We have Human Torch kind of all over the place as well. It's crazy to see how many cards now are getting this power abuse. And that Shadow King is keeping Shuri, Kitty, Angela, Bishop, 
so many cards in the check. I I'm with you, Cozy. Shadow King's a definite riser, which I never thought I would say those words because on paper, this card has always been horrible. But now suddenly with all these effects, with Bounce having this like massive comeback, Shadow King's a legit playable card. Yeah, and we've 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 like talked about this. I think even a couple weeks ago, we were saying like Shadow King's on the rise. He's he's getting there, but now it's official. Like not only is he rising, he's arrived. He's here. He's definitely one that if you're struggling against certain decks, to, to definitely give a shot. Um, now Alex, do you have any other risers before we talk about the followers? I got a couple more on my list. Yeah, I got two. I want to bring up. Uh, I, you're gonna love this one. Three cost destroy card that I know is one of your favorites. It's Venom. I, I feel like Venom's been on the rise for sure. Um, its ability to keep power on the board. I think that Destroy Synergy is really increasing. And even Phoenix Forest, as much as like we're kind of not like, you know, that hot on it, does provide Venom with some opportunities and some interesting decks to like, dude, make some stuff happen. I, I've been a huge fan of Venom lately, and uh, I don't think that's going to change. I think this card's amazing for Destroy. I mean, it's the fact that you can like get rid of he's only three costs you can get rid of something and just build on it and build on it i just feel like yeah phoenix force is one of the reasons but it's like that regenerative discard this thing i've talked about in the past couple of weeks where you are destroying so you're you're, you're helping your deck you're never just you, venom is not in your deck for no reason so you're lowering death's cost whatever it might be building up null but you're keeping the power that was there so you're like there's no con to venom i mean he really feels like the perfect card uh, Venom is definitely one uh, as a riser for myself as well. And with that, and with Phoenix Force, and with some of these de really destroy kind of going back up, it hasn't happened yet. But we had an era where armor was kind of everywhere, and I feel like we could come back to that. I feel like armor in the next month might be in a lot more decks because of where destroy is at and looking ahead at some cards coming. People have like kind of come at me a couple of times on like my meta reports saying like destroys. I'm not seeing that much destroy. I'm like guys, destroy is everywhere. Like we're seeing a lot of destroy, and it's pretty good. It actually isn't. It doesn't have the win rate that like a bounce does at the highest end, but it's an extremely consistent list that like performs amazing. I think that armor should probably make a bit of a comeback. Um, I, we had that heyday with like the armor ongoing destroyer style list. I think that was like peak armor, and it's kind of come down since. Good call, cozy. I like it. I, you know, it's funny. I feel like Destroy, the reason why it just has a... You just don't know. Did they get death? Are they about to drop like 50 power or nothing? Do they Are they bluffing? Like that's why I think death or uh, Destroy's win rate is kind of up and down because of that. So yeah, uh, Armor, I can see a lot of... Uh, and my last one that I'll talk about, I, I have several, but I guess, you know, uh, Nimrod I had with Venom, so you can kind of put those together. Alex, dude, Invisible Woman is, is just bonkers she's she's a great two cost card that, it's so funny that a one power buff i mean she's like the ultimate protection card man the ability for invisible woman to like absorb the enchantress hits is huge for like patriot lists and other lists and just i mean even like something like a wong now right like if you consider what like wong can do if people aren't running cosmo and like now you're getting these lists that are playing other things behind invisible women that aren't just on reveal cards they're not just like the hella style lists I think that the power difference isn't as key as much as like people being willing to try it more often now and then now realizing it's better than it's always been it's kind of the ghost spider cloak heimdall thing right so when invisible woman used to go down it was hella cosmo deck that was it that was all you were seeing and now that we're seeing hit monkey taskmaster weird cards kind of hide behind her it's opening up her use in combo decks her use in these other kind of cheeky decks and her use with ongoing cards. And then you bluff the opponent and you make them burn something, right? You know, time and time again, head game cards continue to be in one of my favorite in Snap. And I think it's for a given purpose. I think Snap is full of head games. And she kind of plays that part. Absolutely. And the last one I want to bring up before we move on to the next topic here is uh, Magneto. And the reason why I bring up Magneto is because I, with the nerf to Doctor Doom, Magneto feels like the last pure beautiful six drop that can kind of go ev everywhere like if you just unlock magneto in your pool three uh free unlock list like it's a kind of card you can just be like you know what i have magneto i'm gonna throw him in there so going to falling cards ice cold cards i don't have near as many as i had maybe on my my hot and rising cards dr doom now he still played a lot i just listed him in one of the most popular cards but he's going down i can't tell you how many games recently that i did the math and I, w I lost because I only had four power to output into a flooded location. It's crazy. He just took such a net big hit in a lot of decks, man. He it, it, it did. It's huge. I mean, it's funny. We, we said, oh, you know, he's uh, 
he's a 615. It's one of the best stat lines in the game. And, you know, spreading the power doesn't matter. But I felt like spreading the power did matter. And now that you're spreading it with two less, listen, that extra energy, we've all lost games by one. We've all tied games at eight cubes, right? Like, and I think it's significant. The nerf is huge, but it's still popular enough that it's not a surprise card yet either. So it's in this weird spot where it feels like you just lose with it. I don't yeah. know how else to put it. Yeah, he's not a bad card. He's just a falling card. You know, man, it's easy to fall when you're on the top, right? It was like the Patriots, you know? Like, once Tom Brady left, it's like, bam, it was a hard fall too, man. And, and Dr. Doom is... He's on a little bit of a hard fall. Yeah, faller for me has been uh, has been Luke Cage. I mean, it's uh, it's coming down. Um, I think that uh, you're, you're obviously being used less in the mirror match with uh, High Evolutionary, um, and I it's it's kind of sad to say, but I feel like a lot of decks still lose to High Evolutionary, even if they have the Luke Cage, which is a little frustrating to some degree. Um, I think it still has a very natural fit in like Silver Surfer lists and other lists that have that like very uh, kind of versatile two drop slot. But like in a discard list, you can't run it. Uh, you're obviously praying you don't get spooter hammed as well. But at the end of the day, like I, I feel like Luke Cage has had a bit of a slide down and it's, it's kind of interesting because I still think it's a good card. It feels like Rogue almost, like a gotcha card, like, it, like, like I got this up my sleeve kind of thing. Yeah, it's weird. He He's like one of those cards that would be good in a 13 card deck, right? Like, not that saying he's the first one out. I just don't ever, when I build my deck out, I'm not like, yeah, I'm missing a card. Let me throw Luke Cage in there. Like, I don't often give him that spot, right? Even though he can deserve it, he does have his use. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I can see that a lot more. He, he maybe didn't have as much of a effect. He, he definitely is in one of those top meta slots right now in those high Evo builds and anti high Evo builds. But yeah, I definitely see him as we continue to drift away and we might even get some nerfs coming up with high Evo. I, I, I would assume eventually, uh, yeah. unless they like where it's at, uh, that, that Luke Cage could be falling a, a little bit more here. What's your other one? My other one has to be uh, Goose. Honestly, Goose just feels like it's coming down in value with the prevalence of bounce. You have a card that is designed to stop, you know, larger cards from entering in. And what does bounce do? Play no large cards and just basically create a massive amount of power into pretty much any lane they want. Uh, the idea of Goose is to basically shut down a location and bounce don't care. It's pretty good against High Evolutionary to some degree, which is nice, but uh, it definitely loses the bounce matchup, which is sad because I love Goose. Yeah, I definitely don't fear Goose as much. It almost feels like the Zabu days, whenever Zabu had just crazy amounts of two and three costs and just like, Goose was just a wasted two drop that you had. Um, and then I think, uh, I know when we first started this topic, we were both talking briefly about uh, just Iceman, right? Iceman yeah. because of Spider-Ham and just, uh, not that, again, it's like the Doctor Doom effect. It's not a bad card, but it's lost a little bit of its oomph. Yeah, and you'd think that even with like Bounce being as popular as it is, like Iceman would have relevance, and it still does. Ironically, it works well in many Bounce lists because you keep bouncing it back and then you get a little additional value there. However, I will say that like it's the spider ham revealing the hand effect that like I'm like, do you I don't want to say this out loud and I know it's another topic, but like, do you buff Iceman so it shows the card? Like, is that the scariest thing I've ever said? No, on you got to hurt the other way around. You got to kill the spider ham, man. I think so. At least I don't know. It, I, do you create two evils or do you get rid of one? I know. It's hard. It's a hard question, but it's it's weird. That's what's with the situation we're in right now, aren't we? We're going to our next subject, and this is one. Listen, okay, you know how many comments you see? It's like, Alex and Cozy, they're too positive. They're too happy all the time. Well, today's the day we finally get to let it out a little bit, all right? We're going to be talking about our most hated cards in Marvel Snap. I don't care if you like playing this card. These are cards that you do not like going up against. You see it revealed. You fear the most. You just... We're letting it out there. You know, if you're listening to the podcast, just shout it to the ether. If you're watching, comment it down below your list. Most hated cards, Alex. We're going to go from 10 to number one in order. Hit me with it. And we don't know each other's list. So I'm actually pretty excited about this. Okay, for me, number 10 is Rock Slide because I drive, I draw the rock every damn time. When they draw, when they play Rock Slide, I'm like, well, here we go. I'm getting that rock. They're going to hit me with a, uh, you know, Dark Hawk. They're going to hit me with that Mystique. They're going to have their perfect draw. They probably already played Korg. Uh, every time I see Rock Slide, I'm like, these friggin' rocks every single time. And sure enough, it's Rock. I'm like, oh, turn six. I got to draw something. Rock. So it's not Korg. It's just Rock Slide. Uh, Korg pisses me off too, but Rock Slide, it's double the rock. It's double the piss off. So like Korg's like, you, you like, you stub your toe, but Rock Slide's like, what, you 
fall over? I don't even know the equivalent. Cork, you stub your toe, rock slide, you break your ankle. Yeah, you shatter your ankle tripping on like a toy, like a Lego piece. Okay, all right, all right. Let it out, let it out. My number 10 might be a little surprising, and it's a card that I don't mind playing, but it's one when I see it, I'm just frustrated. Like immediately, I'm like, damn it, here we go again. It's Dracula. I When I see Dracula played, it's like, and it's always on the location where I'm like, all right, I'm going to buckle down and invest in this location. And then this comes out and I question my entire tactic. I question everything. I really even, I question if I even should be, make content anymore. Dracula pisses me off. And it's, it, it's not even so much the discard Dracula because I can kind of telegraph that. It's when one is just out. It just comes out of nowhere. And it's, this is, it's only number 10. So I'm not too steamed up. But yeah, it, you know, I hate this card. I feel it. I mean, 60% of the time, it's a 420 every time, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. that's exactly how Dracula works. Right. And uh, I mean, if it, I think what's what's helping is like how much we actually love Dracula at the same time. It kind of like counteracts a little bit because I feel that rage. I understand. I hear where you're coming from. My number nine, I think, is going to be a little more universally hated, but I love playing it. So again, this is one of those things like I, this is a card I play a lot. But when it gets played against you, I'm like, how dare you? It's Sandman. Sandman has to be, and listen, yeah. I got nerfed. It, used, it would have been way higher on the list prior, but Sandman has to be one of the most hated cards in Snap. Like, it comes down. Everyone's like, okay, dude, way to break the game. Way to ruin fun for everybody. You hate fun. Congratulations. And Sandman's nine for me. Dude, I don't know how I don't have Sandman on my list, and I can't believe it. I don't want you to spoil yours if I say one of yours. We're going to talk about this the next subject, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to drop this now so everybody can kind of fester on it before our next subject. Jean Grey. Sandman. Worst combo of all time. That might be a new hatred with the Sandman card on a ramp deck. All right, next card for me, number nine, is another one that, you know, I don't see it all that often. Usually means Galactus. Hobgoblin. I, Hobgoblin is just, I don't mind the Hobgoblin in some rando lane. It's it's the Hobgoblin where I decide back and forth, Alex, like, I'm going to go left or right. I'm like, I'll go left. It's red. It's ticking red. Then I go to right. And then he plays the Hobgoblin on the left, fills up the location, auto lose, give up. Good day, sir. Do not collect 200 Pasco. The whole, the whole nine yards. I mean, it's, I think it's designed to be annoying. One might say, <laughs> but I also it's annoying because it means Galactus is probably coming too. <laughs> yeah, and then I play Hobgoblin because I'm like, all right, I lost to it last game, and they have like an Odin, and I'm just like, oh, man, okay, it's time to, it's, it's, it's time to be done for the day. Hit me with number eight. Uh, for me, I know you hate this card too. It's Doc Ock. Doc Ock comes down to number eight for me because I hate playing it because every time I play it, they drop down like every single high value card in existence. And when it gets played to me, it just completely ruins my game and uh, I have to like just walk away. <laughs> it sucks. Doc Ock is so annoying because I feel like I never get the, the good pull and I always get destroyed when they play it against me. And it's making a bit of a resurgence too. You're seeing a little more Doc Ock now in non Galactus list, which I'm kind of excited about. We saw it in some couple tournaments and stuff like that. So that's cool. I like that because it, it is a cool card. I just hate it. I'm sorry. I'm going to reserve my comments for now. Uh, for now. Doc Ock. That's I'm, I'm trying to keep it together. All right, my number eight, and I think people might be surprised it's not higher, and it's one that I know I should be putting in my decks. I don't as much. F and Scorpion, man. Every time I'm playing an Iron Man deck, or just I, it doesn't really matter. There's never a good time Scorpion comes out. And I'm like, oh, good. It was only Scorpion on two, right, dude? Are you ever happy with this? No, Scorpion feels awful. It it is a hated card, and. uh you know, I got to tell you, I think I'm going to talk about it more a little uh, soon, but uh, it, it is a hated card. But for me, like one of the mitigating factors, I play a lot of Surfer. I still slide Luke Cage into it, so it sometimes it doesn't feel as bad. But yeah, Scorpion, like, oh, it's such an irritating card. No, I freaking hate this card. Yeah, dude, it just, I hate it to death. It's a terrible, terrible. Uh, and I'm just going to go back to back, man. Iceman is my freaking seven. Yes, I think both of these are going to be higher on most people's list. Maybe it's because I play them and it does that counterweight thing. Screw these cards. Screw them. We've talked about it. We've vented enough about it. I think we've had a segment six months ago about it. This is always hitting the cards every time. Every single time. And then, like, Icebox comes up as well. And then oh, it yeah. just... Every just, time. Every time. And then maybe nowadays you have a Sarah and a six cost. Then Iceman comes, hits Sarah. The pig comes out, hits Sarah. Your Sarah's out of play. It's, it's all bad, dude. Yeah, it literally, it's on reveal. Hit your five cost. <laughs> every time. <laughs> It's just so bad. It's like on reveal, hit magic or Sarah. Like, exactly. That's literally exactly what Iceman does. Yeah, it's it's an annoying card, and one might say that I'm going to talk about it soon because my number seven 
is Spider-Man. I listen, Spider-Man's so annoying. It's it, okay, it's it used to be higher when it was like the heyday of Galactus. It's like, oh, they're gonna Spider-Man. Like e every single time, right? Now with the location lock uh, lockdown being what it is, it's like you worry about Professor X, you worry about Spider-Man. Like it's just Spider-Man's up there for me. And every time it comes down, I'm just like, oh, F you, because I'm not playing Doctor uh, Doctor Doom anymore because Doctor Doom kind of feels bad now. And that's the only way I could have accessed that lane. I just feel upset and here's your cubes. It's funny, now that Galactus has been calmed down, I actually don't hate Spider-Man much anymore. But he definitely is, I mean, first of all, did they give him the worst voice line of all time? I like, I cannot stay was like, hey, I, mean, I don't even know what the hell he says. Something about neighbors, something. I, I, I hate him. I, I, that's the worst part about Spider-Man. But other than that, I, it, he he doesn't bother me as much anymore. But I think what's annoying about him is that he's not like Pro X where you can kind of see him coming. I feel like he's in decks where you don't see him coming. Uh, that's a good thing, though. I like I like that, but I feel like I see him coming and I know he's coming. I'm like, God damn it, they're going to Spider-Man. I'm, I'm getting already upset about it. And then the Spider-Man drops and, and I got to buy a new monitor because I have my fist through it. Are we at number six now? We're at number six, and uh, I can go. I got a card that, honestly, I have such a love-hate relationship with it. I love it. I love the Archer variant, which I know you have. It's Scarlet Witch. It's Scarlet Witch because I don't want to hate it, Cozy. I just don't want to hate it. I respect what the card does from a lore perspective. I think it's one of the best design cards in Marvel Snap. But, like, why? Why do the RNG gods have to curse me every damn time? I can't play this card because... Like, you literally have to play her last in, like, a turn of, a, of events because you know, like, she's going to bring up Death's Domain or you you know she's going to bring up Bar With No Name. Like, I get crushed with Scarlet Witch all the time. It's mind-boggling. It's so fun. Uh, th this is why I can't wait to hear our viewers list because I feel like... By the way, I'm sick, guys. That's why my voice is complete garbage. I feel like everyone's... Like, I would never put Scarlet Witch on my top 10. But, like, for you, you have... I mean, like, you have, like, Doc Ock you know, less on the hate Alex list of Scarlet Witch. So, like, I know that means that you've had some complete garbage situations with this card. Yeah, you know it, Cozy. It's a total disaster sometimes. But you know what? That's what makes playing the card fun, also stressful. And I get at the end of the day, Marvel Snap is a game of emotions. We like to pretend it's not. But tell me that this game does not get you emotional sometimes. <laughs> oh, for sure. Every list is going to be different. My number six is a card that's one of my most favorite, probably on my top ten most favorite cards in the game. But hey, because of that, it's also one of my most hated in the game. It's Daredevil. I feel like they have laid eggs in my brain when Daredevil comes out. Like, it's over. They know exactly what I'm about to do, what I'm capable of. It, I'm not going to get the cubes I wanted. I'm not going to get the big pop-off. Daredevil could be higher on this list. I think I did a, a, a gift to put him at number six. It actually surprises me to hear you throw shade at Daredevil because I know how much you love Daredevil. But you're right, like when they have Daredevil on the board, I mean, that's the one thing about Conquest. Daredevil feels less all in with the snaps because like, you know what their deck's like, you know what they have available to them. But at the same time, like a Daredevil in a Conquest deck gives you so many additional opportunities to just snake cubes out of your opponent. So I can see why it's annoying, like when they have Daredevil and you don't. But I guess the uh, the remedy for that, Cozy, is to just add Daredevil to your deck. But then he does nothing. It's true. What is your number? Did I, uh, are we on five, six? Yeah, my number five is uh, going to be Scorpion, actually. That's where Scorpion ended up on my list. And uh, for all the reasons we talked about before, like, it's just so frustrating to have played against you. Um, you know, the meta relevance of Luke Cage is starting to dwindle. So you didn't have the natural, like, huh, I had Luke Cage anyway, bro. And now it's just Scorpion comes out and you feel really sad, Cozy. Number five for me is a newcomer. Somewhat newcomer. And never would I have thought he was going to be on this list. But because of just lockdown decks, the new... Cyclops is 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 an absolute cancer in Marvels. I I cannot. This guy is always. I would rather a Juggernaut. Just don't even have my cards in the storm lane than this guy that is always just gonna beam him down. I can't stand him. I can't believe this. We went from begging, literally begging, for Cyclops to get some respect. Cyclops gets respect, and here you are, just Do, knocking like him, him down a peg. I don't like him. He's annoying as hell. It was a zap zap. And I'm like, I lose now. And then like, of course, because I cut Luke Cage like everyone else is doing. So then it's like, yeah, yeah. Cyclops is annoying. But come on. He's one of the best move cards in Marvel Snap. And now he gets the opportunity to actually contribute to a location and make the Incredible Hulk a 12, uh, 620. 
So yeah, I like Cyclops. I feel like that such as Marvel Snap. Like we want this card. Everybody wants High Evo. High Evo looks so fun. And then we hate him immediately, right? Like because he's too good. Uh, yeah, Cyclops, he just, he hits one of my annoy buttons. Don't know why. Maybe it's because he is everywhere at the moment. Uh, like Wasp, I, I don't mind. Hulk, really don't have a big problem with it at the moment, to be honest. It's Cyclops. He's the one in the high Evo deck I can't stand. But number four for me is Iceman. That's where Iceman lands on my list at number four. Um, for all the reasons why we talked prior, I mean, it literally is the card that disrupts so many combos for yourself and never for your opponent. I feel like I never see them play their Iceman card. Maybe it's because I hit their Sarah or something, honestly. But uh, yeah, for me, Iceman comes in at number four. Cozy, what's your four? Listen, it was game five, match five. All the cubes on the line. Eight cubes on the line. And this one instance not only had me create this entire subject, but also put this card at number four. And I don't even know why. I think it's when I see it, right? I, I'm thinking about when I actually see it. Not just looking at all the cards. Which ones do I hate? My friend, when Rogue does come out, when this card does come out, it's over. It's over for me and my, and my greedy ass ongoing decks and they take a null and they win the game for me. Rogue is just the card you never see. And when you see it, it does exactly why you hate it. And you know, funny enough, I have Cyclops and Rogue. I got a lot of X-Men hate on here. It's only because I lost an entire infinity. But I, I, I've I, never seen Rogue and be like, thank God it's only Rogue. This, of all the cards we've talked about thus far, this has been the card for me that has sounded most like emotional damage on you. Like this, this like Rogue did something to you recently. This, this is your Scarlet Witch. Yeah, hundred percent. Like you clearly have some very fresh scars with Rogue, and listen, I I respect it. I under, I understand the emotion, but I've been putting Rogue in my Silver Surfer decks and absolutely clapping noobs with it. So I'll be honest with you, I'm I'm loving Rogue right now, and maybe for all the reasons why you're hating it. But those noobs, yeah, those noobs would put it on this list. But uh, you can you can love a card. But also, obviously, just completely hate it. What do you have at number three? I don't want to hate a card I love, but I love Spider-Ham. But, like, seriously, this card might be a problem. Like, it's number three. Might it could have been higher. Uh, yeah, it could have been higher. Like, I, it started, my list started with it at number one. And then eventually it drifted downwards slightly to number three because I still love playing it. But this card, specifically in Conquest, is so problematic. It is basically Leech, is what it is. It's Leech, except now you have, like, the bounce. You're bouncing your Leech. Oh, my God. Spider Ham is infuriating. Number three. And again, I try to go off of emotion. I try to go off of how I feel when I go against whatever card this might be. For me personally, I cannot stand this card. Probably I can stand it a bit more than others. Shang-Chi. I have Shang-Chi at number three. I, this used to be a lot higher. But now that Shang-Chi is everywhere, you know, I just fully have the anticipation that he's coming like even even so it's like i'm scarred i see monster island i'm like okay he's dead like that monster's gonna die i i hate him but i don't hate him as much as others i understand what you're saying like shang chi though does, okay does it not feel like the most necessary evil in marvel snap though i'm so proud of you saying this because i think this was on your most hated at some point it was but it was also on my it was my number one card on our top 10 best cards in marvel snap list so like talk about the double-edged sort of the uh, respect, right? So it's like, it's crazy because like this card has to exist. Like if it didn't exist, Marvel Snap would be horrible to play. But at the same time, it's so annoying that it exists. But because it also has to be in so many decks. Like when you're designing a deck, it that's the one thing about Shang-Chi. The one negative thing I want to say that kind of frust frustrates me about him. I feel like if I don't have him in a deck, I'm not deck building right. Like I feel like he has to be one of the 12, 90% of the time because of how important it is to the meta. Or you'll have like Zabu the deck, and then you're like, well, I mean, he's a four cost, but I, I should put Shang Chi. Should I put Enchantress? Yeah, Ben Broad's most hated card is Shang Chi, and I bet you the viewers, it, it's gonna be Shang Chi for most of them as well. Uh, yeah, so that's my number three. Number two. Number two for me is gonna be Galactus. This is where Galactus comes in here. Um, I know it got changed, but for me, it's I still just I just I just hate it. I just don't like it. I don't like like the new way it's been adjusted. Like I get it, but at the same time, oh, it's Hobgoblin. Okay, here comes Galactus. It's like, it still has this very, like, I want it to be a surprise card, and it's not a surprise card yet. I know I'm getting Galactus. And when I get Galactus and I don't expect it, I'm hitting I'm hitting the fist bump. Because I'm like, yes, this is what I want. I will lose eight cubes to a Galactus player, but if I don't know it's a Galactus player and you hit me with that Galactus, you earn those cubes, and I'm happy. That was a good Marvel Snap experience for me. I don't care how many cubes I lost. I don't care if it's an infinite run. I, I just doesn't matter. But it's, I'm not losing those games. 
I, every time I'm like, here comes Galactus, and sure enough, it's Galactus, and it's, uh, it's they snap. It's just, it's just, it feels too samey still. Galactus is not on my list, but when I look at my list, I feel like a lot of these are based off of cards that I hate because of all the Galactus scars. So, like, great example is going to be one of my next two, but also, I mean, if you just look at like Electro, he's not on my list, but I see that little zap and I'm like, that SOB. Like, I, I, I don't even want to know what I'm dealing with at the moment. It's like the Yondu effect. It's the same deal. It, it, a, it's always getting rid of a card. Yondu should be on my list. He's not. Galactus is not on mine. I get the hate. Don't mind him anymore. He's he maybe on my top 20 or something, but I, I don't mind him. Uh, I got Spider Ham here at number two. Easily could have put this at number one. They just have to get rid of the, the, the intel to, to make it a little bit better. But it's also like popularity effect at the moment. I feel like I'm like a 90-year-old chain smoker right now. Uh, I feel like it's the popularity of the card at the moment. It's everywhere. You're getting smacked by the hammer. If I go into a conquest and they've got the pig, I'm like, it's going to be a long 10 minutes. Dude, is it just because it's too common right now? What is it about the damn pig? I think the damn pig is problematic because of how impactful it can be in any game. And it can be repeatedly impactful with like the popularity of bounce. They're bouncing it back. They're using it again. You play it on turn one. You hit like, you know, a, you hit like a five cost and you bounce it back. You then you hit a six cost in the next turn or two. Um, it's just it's just a complete nuisance. And um, it doesn't feel that great to play, but it feels horrible to have played against you. Right. Um, it can still feel good to play, but I'm just, oh, look, I hit there. I actually hit a Giganto the other night. I'm like, I can't believe this. And then uh, Daily Bugle came out and gave me the Giganto. And I was like, oh, justice. That's got to say. But yeah, it's it's funny that you identify this card as being problematic because it definitely is. It's going to be near the top for most people. And it, I'm one thing that has to be said, I'm kind of really glad they put it into Series 4. Because if it was Series 5 and the people that spent those 6,000 tokens were really like putting this really annoying card on people, I think it would be even more frustrating. But the fact that they made it just ever so slightly more accessible gives it an opportunity to be like, hey, listen, it was Series 4, more people can buy it. So it's it's a little more common because if it was Series 5, I think it, it would have felt more pay to win. I don't want to even say that word. I don't want to say the word. But if it was Series 5, I think it would have been a huge misfire. So I think they nailed it in Series 4. But this card is extremely irritating. At least paid to annoy. Yeah, I. Yeah. It, it's also because of how damn like cute it is. It's got the hammer. Like, Iceman, at least he's, like, pissed off. He's throwing ice in my face. I'm just like, damn this, damn this pig. Number one for me, Alex. I was almost shocked that it was so low on your list. This is my easy most hated card. And I don't mind playing it. But I don't at the moment because of the hatred in my heart. Dr. Octopus is far and away, far and away, my most hated card. And it's for a lot of the reasons you listed earlier. It's always the Doc Ock that I don't expect. It's, it, it, it's mostly the non-Galactus Doc Ocks. I think there's some pent up anger from the Galactus days. But damn it, this card, man. And it, I think it is too. I'm such a combo guy. I'm such a, like, I love pulling off these cheeky eight cube wins. I saved up everything perfectly. Maybe I skipped turn four because I'm going to save it for right. Doc Ock screws everything up. And then I, you know, you, you look, you have that moment of despair and hope where you look at your cards and you, you're like, just don't pull. And before you can even think of the word pull, it's out there and it's gone. It's over. Or the order is over. And you play like Devil Dinosaur, Enchantress. It's never Enchantress, Devil Dinosaur. It's always there to kill you. Doc Ock, man, they built them perfect because the hate is real. Listen, this has been a card that like, oh man, you've been angry about for a long time. Like we, this came out last month. We were talking about the problems with uh, with Galactus. You're like, it's not Galactus. It's Dr. Octopus. It you were like so upset about it. And then uh, it's funny because you're right. It's never like Devil Dinosaur Mystique. It's always like Mystique, Devil Dinosaur. And then like, you know, and, and Enchantress, of course, right? Why you'd run all those three cards in your deck is another question, but... Listen, I understand the hate behind Dr. Octopus. And uh, it's funny because actually going back to another callback on our, our recent podcast, I remember talking about why you hated Jeff the Shark. And I remember saying is because you love very combo centric lists that like really come together to truly punish people for four and eight cubes. And Dr. Octopus is like completely counter to that because it takes all your combo pieces and says, F all of them. They're coming right now in whatever the hell order I want. So for the exact same reason why you cut Jeff the Shark. Because you know what? If Doc Ock pulled Jeff the Shark, would you be sad? No, you wouldn't. No, here's the thing, though. And then I, I finally buckled down, right? It's not even like Galactus and I get a... No, I buckled down and I put this damn card in my deck and then I pull and it's like, infinite. 
Giganto that nobody puts in their list. Shang -Chi. It, it, yeah, yeah. Just Shang Chi kills. Right. Yeah, exactly. It always, hundred percent of the time, every time. Yeah, that's hilarious. I listen. I understand the heat. I hate it too, but uh, just not quite as much. But my number one card, cozy, and uh, I. You know what? It's it's for a very specific reason. It's high evolutionary. I know this is going to be a very hot, controversial take, but high evolutionary number is my number one hated card right now, and uh, it's not because it's not good. It's not even because it's too overpowered, but I'll tell you why I don't like it. I love deck crafting. I love deck crafting so much. I think Marvel Snap is at its best. When people are crafting decks, being creative, and uh, and just flexing those creative muscles behind the collection screen. And I feel like every time I go against the high evolutionary player, I know exactly what's in the 12 card deck. There's almost no variation. The game feels monotonous. It's remarkably consistent in something like Conquest. I don't know. It's just feel every time I queue into someone who's playing high evolutionary, I'm just like, oh, all right, dude, you really want these cubes that bad? Just take them. Just take them from me. I don't care. I don't care anymore. I've, I, I like, I, oh, I like the thought of retreating crosses my mind. Turn one. Just like, okay. There's, there's your, uh, there's your Misty Knight retreat. You just have the cubes, man. And not that I can't win. I just don't want to play the game against the high evolutionary player anymore. I, I just, I, I'm, I'm actually angry. I don't know how to explain it. Like, I, I almost want, if you're playing High Evolutionary right now, like, I don't blame you. It's a great card. It performs well. It's going to get you infinite. It's going to get you infinity wins and conquests. It's going to do the job. But, like, come on, man. Come on. If you're an infinite already, what, what the hell are you doing? Craft some interesting decks. You know, it's, I feel like he's so divisive, dude, because, like, uh, I, I know Molt shares the hate for this card. Molt freaking hates this card. I, I, I love you, Molt. If you're listening, I get like a 10 paragraph essay on how much he hates High Evo. I think Dexter doesn't mind it too much. I'm on the don't mind it train, dude, because for me, I'm like, and maybe it's because I'm playing the cards that counter Hulk. I'm like, all right, goodbye, good sir. Like, I'm going to get an easy clap win. Like, I, I don't mind it. I don't think the consistency is all the way there, but I get your points. A a and I understand the majority's points. I would feel like I'm probably out of the majority of how much I don't like. I feel like if they adjust this card, I hope it's not the Hulk uh, because I love what they've done there. But, dude, I had Cyclops on my list, so I, the, the hate does reside in me. It's just maybe one card specifically. Maybe the Wa. I don't know. But definitely Wa, Cyclops, those are kind of my my cards in there I hate. And, yeah, it's my damn fault for not running Luke Cage. But I I, I hear you. Did you feel good getting this out? It, it felt good. It felt good. I wanted to say that. And at the same time, let me also say, like, if you're playing High Evolutionary, there, there's nothing wrong with that. You spent 6K tokens on it. It's a damn good card. It's going to do what you want it to do. It's just, I get concerned. Like, I don't want us to be slaves to the meta, you know? Like, I want us, I really do want us to, like, deck craft. Like, we talked about it before. The, the game was at its best, absolute best, when, you know, you, you're crafting things on the fly, you're unlocking new cards, and that's what the Spotlight Cash System is going to do, by the way. Like, isn't it? I'm so glad we're coming back to this. I'm so glad this cash, new cash system is coming out because I hope it encourages people to take more chances with deck building. I, I just really hope it does. Because when you're playing high Evo nonstop, I think you're sucking the fun out of the game for yourself. Like when it's when it's like a twenty something percent play rate in the meta, like that's it's it's too much. Not because it's too good, but it's, it's just. Yeah, I mean, I, I can only imagine when playing high evolutionary against high evolutionaries. Like, I, I, Cozy, be honest. Like us as content creators, we can't play high Evo. Like no one wants to watch us play high evolutionary. No, I feel. I think we, last week we we went on that like tangent of like we can't, uh, you know. But honestly, too, he also just feels like the meta deck of today, right? So like that's yeah. why he's kind of there uh, compared to the other ones. Listen, it felt great getting this out. I feel a little bit better inside. I still absolutely hold on. Let me uh, reach over here and just say I still absolutely <laughs> hate Doc Ock. But other than that, I think he's great. And lastly, Alex, we have our Jean Grey discussion, the card that's coming out later tonight. And uh, my friend, if, if people hated the cards we just talked about, I think this is one that could definitely make the list. Jean Grey, as iconic as she is, I think she is going to be an absolute uh, nightmare, but also really fun and unique card. If you don't know, Jean Grey is a 3-3 and she has an ongoing effect that both players must play their first card each turn if possible. Now, we talked about her last week. We're going to keep it more short and sweet. But I think this card immediately enters not, we don't have to say the meta, but also the meta. Like, she's going to be everywhere, I think.
it's it's very interesting that you say that because although it's going to be a relatively expensive card series five it's going to be accessible through the spotlight caches so more people could have more of a chance to get it which is exactly what that system is designed to do so it's going to be in the hands of more people and this effect is insane it's actually one of the most uh one of the most restrictive and high impact effects that have been released in some time because if not like is this one of the hardest hitting cards in the last couple months? I, I think so. It does. It feels like that because like, I think Kang was like, oh, here we go. Or Negasonic. This one, you don't even have to theory crap. Like you already know it's going to be a little wild. And outside of the Wasp and the movable cards, I don't know. Do And if there's, uh, okay, so let's just talk about how it's going to work, right? So when you play Jean Grey down, they have to have the ability to play a card. So you can't play this on Sanctum and then play Scarlet Witch and then it changes or whatever. Sorry, you play this down. Scarlet Witch changes it to Sanctum. Doesn't work like that, right? You have to have the ability to play cards there. Now, if they play a Jean Grey and you have a Jean Grey, you'll have your choice on which location that you'll want to play on, which I also think is kind of interesting. But other than that, you will be forced to play this card, which I do not think this is a turn three card. I think this is a possible, uh, well, Silver Surfer decks, we'll get to that. This is going to slap in there. But this is kind of like a turn five with a two cost with it. it it's going to be, oh man, it's going to be nuts. I think you hit it right perfect when you said that it's a turn five play. I think that the ability to play it on turn three is still interesting. There's still some viable uh, synergy there. But forcing your opponent into a specific lane on turn six is insane. And I think that, like, honestly, it makes Jean Grey one of the most powerful control cards in the game because it's relatively inexpensive. With something like a Silver Surfer list, you can combo it with a two drop or something else. Like, you could actually play Jean Grey. And I mean, I would say Goose, but why would you even need to do that? But now they basically have two locations that are inaccessible, right? Um, but ultimately, like, Jean Grey's ability to completely dictate where your opponent has to play is insane. And if you play it into a location where, like, they might already be winning, it's crazy. Slow moving decks. Uh, Arnim Zola trying to do that. Now you have to force them to play into that location. Those greedy decks. Uh, dude, she's perfectly on curve for control. There, this is... Uh, man, Spider-Ham, we're like, I think this is going to be pretty good. It was damn good. This is one of those cards. Like, I have no hesitation saying that this is going to be a great card. It's going to piss people off. But this damn thing, the amount of... like, Dude, let's just go to some cards right now, okay? We got to start with... I think it was your number two most hated. It's almost like I'm curious to see what would have happened after this whole nerf thing. Galactus Dex, this is a huge shutdown. An absolute colossal shutdown to Galactus Dex. But then you also just have so many other ways to shut down decks that are looking to get stuff done. Now you have ways to build your deck with Jean Grey in this control card that it's going to naturally go in. Kind of, you remember that flooding deck that was out there for a while with Nebula? It was like the, the Storm, the Magneto, the, uh, the Gamora was in there. I feel like that's going to kind of come back on top. And you're going to have this Gamora deck. All these cards that capitalize off of what Jean Grey is pulling. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we even talked about uh, Shadow King at some point. Like, if you're forcing your opponent to a specific location, suddenly, I'm again, the Silver Surfer mind going, Shadow King has value because all of the buffs that they're generating in that one location has a very reliable hit with that Shadow King. Like, Negasonic. Think about what Negasonic does with yep. Jean Grey. Like, if you play ne if you play Jean Grey and you, you maintain initiative... You play Negasonic into that location and you just trade whatever they play less. Not not just that, but maybe you play a card like a Drax. And then on turn five, you play Negasonic and they're playing their arrow or whatever it is, their high impact turn five play, and it just booms, right? Like I think that Negasonic gets a huge buff from um this card as well. Like it's just it doesn't, it's not like a simple card. Like this card has ramifications across the meta. Yeah, there's, there's naturally cards that you want to play into Jean Grey and then the ones that counter it. So obviously, like the biggest counters at the top of my head, if you aren't getting this card or it's going to be everywhere. Obviously, we already talked about it. I'll go to it first. Uh, Enchantress will be your number one counter. You see Jean Grey, you play this, it's done. Now, to be fair, they kind of made you play this Enchantress and maybe they have Devil Dinosaur or something else up their sleeve. They make you burn this card. I think that's going to be very interesting. Uh, but also in the same vein... Jeff the Shark, this is what I love about him. I think we have confirmation. Jeff doesn't give a damn. So you can play Jeff on, let's say Jean Grey's on the right location. Jeff goes on the left. You could play your other card at another location. So Jeff kind of has this, Jeff goes where he wants to, and he counts where he wants to, which I think is very interesting. Zero cost, obviously. Uh, these cards that are going to counter, Kitty Pride, another great example. Uh, just a non-committal card 
that you can throw in there. Wasp. Uh, these are the ones that I naturally see working with Jean Grey. Um, even, you know, what you said, you had Brood on your list, Mr. Sinister. These kind of quick filling cards as well. Thanos, I think is going to be good because you can just jam it with your stones and then worry about it later. Dude, I, either way, Jean Grey is getting what she wants done. And that's forcing your hand to do something that you didn't want to do in the first place. Dude, I, it's just wild. Now, comments might say, well, what if, what if you play Goose into Jean Grey? If your opponent cannot play a card there, they don't have to. So that you got to remember that. You can't like double down and just like lock your opponent out, right? So it's important to remember that there's control aspects, but you know, don't get crazy with it. Dude, what about Mojo? I, I think Mojo might be a, a decent card, right? Cards that like you want there to be clogged. Like Mojo is almost a card you can play earlier than usual because they have to play in this lane too. That's what I love about it. It's not just you. They're going to have to, and now you're getting a 2-8. One thing I really like about Jean Grey, though, is that it has a very similar interaction to the Raft. And let me explain. This is something that was kind of like going through my mind. So the Raft, one of the major risks of the Raft, which is the location that when you fill it up, you get a free six cost, is that if you overcommit to it early, you're likely to have not enough power to compete in that lane like if you fill it with garbage just to basically drop one drops in it to get to get your free six drop that location itself is now full and it might be very easy for your opponent to counteract it so like something i want to just kind of bear mention of is the idea of like being forced to fill a location early might actually be disadvantageous because if you're not careful with it you might underpower the location just to get out of it and basically just give it up as well yeah, and I'm wondering, and we don't know the interaction here, but I, I'm just, I'm curious for like Storm. If you play Storm, does it shut down that location? Because technically no one can play there, right? So that is interesting what you said in the raft. That's where like uh, Silver Surfer, Kazar, those kind of cards are going to do good. It, isn't it cool? If, if Storm, Negasonic, we have X-Men, X-Men, Hell, Cyclops, and High Evo, you know, have the guaranteed lane where they're going to have, you, you get the double negative push-offs like immediately. Uh, it, there's some X-Men synergy. Uh, but that's a good point there uh, uh, as far as like the RAF comparison. Uh, it, Guardians of the Galaxy naturally, obviously, are going to go pretty well with it. Movable cards, we've seen that. Nightcrawler, Jeff, uh, Hell Vision, maybe even Phoenix Force. I want to say like move is decent, but here's the thing. The person that has Jean Grey, if, they're, if they identify you're playing a move deck, you just play Jean Grey left side. Like, that, yeah. That's like debilitating. It would completely crush moveless from that perspective because like you can't Doctor Strange. I mean, you, you can Heimdall, but what are you going to do with Heimdall on the left side, right? But imagine having an opportunity to play Jean Grey into Ebony Maw on your own side <laughs> and then shutting yourself out of the location yourself, right? But you, you just can't do it. That's probably why it's a three cost. But I, I do think that this card has like some amazing synergies. And like, again, I just want to go back to, I do think that um, Jean Grey into Negasonic and eventually like a Null or something like that could be absolutely huge depending on what you destroy. Like, I think this card is going to have value and even destroy base lists. Um, it might be difficult to get out of those, but that's where like the Jeff the Sharks and even a Vision, for instance, and, and as we mentioned prior, something like a Captain Marvel could come in handy uh, because you can uh, move out of those locations while actually generating value for your deck elsewhere. Um, but like, yeah, it's it's a truly fascinating card. It's going to be one of those ones that as we get more experience playing with, we're going to start to really see its power. But I mean, Control is getting another absolutely massive tool. And I'm excited that it's a tool that's relatively inexpensive, by the way, because we, we have five costs locked down with Professor X, Spider-Man, and now we have something in the mid to early game that completely changes the way in which the game is played. You know what else it does, dude, is like, these are always good value plays, uh, but like, Sarah Control Bounce can continue to be good. Bounce is actually gonna be fantastic, right? Because you just play your free Iceman in there and then you could do whatever you want. Uh, but even like the Miles Morales and a card that kind of disappeared for a while in She-Hulk, right? Like, if they do play this late, I think this is where like She-Hulk is going to get some value because then you can play this for the one cost that you're going to drop. If they play it on four, then you have that ability to react to it a little bit. Doctor Doom, we said was a faller, might be a staying stagnant because of this. So that's going to be interesting. Depending where it's played, you can have things like Mr. Fantastic and Claw and still putting those power points in other position. I think the problem is the opponent, the Jean Grey, will always have their deck designed Jean Grey. A lot of decks won't. And that, and like, man, talk about destroy. What about destroy, Alex? Like this completely, if they play a Deadpool, you just play, you just play, you just play Jean Grey on another lane. You completely shut it down. Yeah, I think that it is huge against destroy, especially if you can consider something like, okay, if you armor 
a location with Jean Grey, and then like you can play larger cards there, and then they can't really answer to it, and they can't Shang Chi because it's in an armored location, and they're forced to play there. Not just that, but like, yeah, what do you do with a Deadpool that now what you just keep feeding to the same location, and it to to destroy it to keep it kind of ramping up? You're never filling the location, so you can't really move out of it because if you're destroying things, and you can't move, you can't move outward. Like and then you have what your your free saber tooth, but you have to play it to fill the location, so you can't do the turn six miracle. It is super restrictive to destroy, isn't it? I think, yeah, and I like what you said about armor, because if you play Gene, then armor, even if they kill Monga the Deadpool, it's like they, they don't want to replay it there, or Nova, or whatever it might be. I just feel like this is one of those that is going to get a, hit a little bit harder. And if you think about it, discard a little bit too. Yeah, they have Swarm, but that is such a design deck to play a card at a certain location and do this and do the Dracula. It, it's going to mix up the meta. It definitely is. And um, I'm not entirely sure that it's going to like be like breaking. I, I think it might be restrictive and it might take some getting used to. What I'm actually looking forward to the most is that, uh, first of all, it's a Series 5 card where it's entering the, cl uh, the collection cache uh, spotlight system. So it's going to have more access to more people. And I think that people are going to have to build decks anticipating Jean Grey. I think it's going to have that much of an impact on the meta where you have to be prepared for it. I think you have to respect Jean Grey. And um, it's going to be up to individual deck builders to find creative ways to do that in their favorite decks. Because if you don't build for Jean Grey and if you don't respect what Jean Grey is capable of, I think that you're in a situation where you're going to get punished extremely hard. Just like you mentioned with the Destroy example. If you're not ready... To deal with Jean Grey, then like if you're playing a Deadpool deck, like what do you do? You just you just lose. You just retreat basically because you're not going to be able to to access those other locations effectively. Any other cards that you think are going to just maybe even just throw me a couple crazy crazy ones? We still don't know, and I don't know if we've received confirmation as of recording about the Agatha. That's been something weighing on my mind. Oh, I yeah, don't know right. if Agatha counts as a player, if Agatha has to commit to the Jean Grey location, if Agatha can play outside of it. I, I actually don't know, and I don't know if we've received confirmation yet. I know. I'm surprised we got, like, no comments on that, guys. I, I was, like, waiting for, like, a couple comments, like, break it down. There, I don't think there was a lot on that particular episode. Uh, Mantis, I think, goes up a lot more, too. Like, way yes. more. I thought Mantis was going to go up with Nebula. Was it really the case? I think Mantis will go up significantly when it comes to Jean Grey because it's a one-cost commitment and you steal a card. All the Guardians benefit, like, you know, but but Mantis, you are right. By, by stealing a card, it's like, it's basically turning. Is it is it a better cable now? Because it's a cheaper card mm -hmm. that you can play to the location, fill it up a little bit, and then you basically get to steal a card from them, prop up your, uh, your other cards while also having something that you can play yourself. I think it's... It is interesting, and I mean, Mantis has been so utterly unplayable for so long. It's nice to see it get something, but at the same time, it's a 1-2. So if you think about what your deck looks like, if you're playing Jean Grey into a location that maybe... You're probably playing Jean Grey into a location where they have nothing, right? Um, and then you you play basically your, your Mantis to force, like you might be underpowered. And another card I want to bring up here is uh, it's not a, um, a Guardians of the Galaxy, but how does it interact with something like a Kingpin? Because Kingpin's primary problem is that you run out of, like your opponent just plays into the Kingpin location, does, does not allow you to play the Magneto or the Arrow. Suddenly, if you force them to play into a specific location, allowing Kingpin to have some open space... I mean, you could potentially do a lot of damage, but it would require that Jean Grey comes out on four or five. Isn't it so wild that Silver Surfer, it feels like every week, it's like why I want different costs to get their own card. We're like new Silver Surfer every week. It's a new Silver Surfer die. Three costs when they get at all either new to the game, uh, even like we've seen it with the OTAs. It's crazy that Jean Grey's ability with Silver Surfer is going to be wild and listen i've played some silver king they're fun are they crazy eh. but you know you can win gold conquest with them but yes the biggest problem is it's either invisible woman or storm and then you don't get one of those and then you get kingpin but this is kind of like another cog in the machine that's a three cost I, it is interesting and you know it's crazy i, I think that uh living tribunal it, it's like they're not going to play enchantress into their Jean Grey. Obviously, it's ongoing. They don't even have it in the deck. I doubt it. I absolutely doubt it. So that's where maybe this card maybe gets... It, it, I, I love it because I feel like Snap always has decks. I can counter decks. I can counter cards. I can counter... I love it, man. It's... I never thought Living Tribunal, I'll be honest. Not in a million years that I think you're going to bring up Living Tribunal on this podcast. 
But um, you, you are right. It does mitigate the effect. It does go uh, wide by design. I think that ultimately when we start piloting Jean Grey based decks, we're going to be in a situation where we start to identify how to actually position it to have the greatest impact, right? We're going to be punishing our opponents. We're not going to be putting ourselves out deep. And um, I actually am looking forward to, I'm trying to design lists where Jean Grey is the fourth card of yours that drops into a, a lane. So really like your that lane's done and you're good. And they're just like, what do I do now? I have to play there, and it's turn five or six. I think that's where she's going to be in her strongest. So early on, you mentioned she's not necessarily always a turn three card. I think she's going to really excel on turn five. That's interesting. I like it a lot. Maybe just wave out Ultron, get it over with, and then figure it out from there. Uh, no, uh, listen, guys. Jean Grey, definitely going to be very, very different of a card. Very exciting and or polarizing in the same way, right? We've waited for the card to come out for a while. Want to hear y'all's opinion on the new control queen and honestly... With the spotlight caches, it's going to take some time. Some people might get her on the very for first spotlight cache. Others, it could take all four. We have seen the data mines. I don't know, it, it, you know if they're absolutely true. We'll know in one day. But Noel, Living Tribunal, maybe by the time this launches, it's already out. And Jean Grey is the first spotlight cache, which I think is an interesting three. Uh, give me, your, on your way out, give me your quick fire thoughts on that spotlight cash i think it had to be gene gray up front because uh as we, we discussed last week that we felt like it could have been the season pass card to, so to lead with it this month i think makes a lot of sense uh noel it had to be noel or jeff or Darkhawk. it had to be right because those were the three that i think sparked the most ire from the community i would have actually probably picked Darkhawk over noel for the first set to get a little more excitement because i think Darkhawk has more universal appeal but noel's still an absolutely banger card specifically because destroy is making is having a resurgence right now like destroy is coming back and if you've been waiting for that null to play into your new destroy deck then you're going to get that opportunity and living tribunal i think was the as you kind of we kind of alluded to there, there's got to be one card they're just like mm. <laughs> the yeah. filler card there, there still is the opportunity to get the random four or five uh series card as well right so it's it's technically a cash it's a spotlight cache of four objects not just the three but yeah those are the three guaranteed i feel like in this one yeah, Noel has a strong case, and I love Noel, but I feel like if you open up Jean Grey on the first spotlight cache, you're done. Call it out. I don't think you need it, because you don't want to double roll for the Living Tribunal and or Noel when you don't know what's coming next week. And we should know when this all drops, we should know the schedule. You know what I mean? Though That's how I would go about it, at least. I would agree. If you can pull Jean Grey number one, then I, th I think you can save your caches and walk away. I, I mean, I would like Noel, but... You're right. You're running the risk. Do I, do I get Null or do I get Living Tribunal? And Living Tribunal, for the most part, is hot, filthy, just engulfed in flames garbage. So realistically, you, you want to dodge that if you can. Uh, man, we're, are we deep into this meta of like how many pulls you go into? I think so. I think again? this is going to be a new topic, man, of like when and how much you commit and what we what we like. And, you know, we'll give our one through five stars on the on the spotlight catches. And with all that, guys, if you want to go ahead and check out our other subjects, we'll be talking about Phoenix Force, Good, Bad, The Ugly, The Patch Note Predictions, and the best free pull three unlocks over on Alex's channel. Alex, just always good, buddy. It's always fun having these conversations. I, I love it. This is my favorite time of the week, Cozy, to, to get to sit down, talk Marvel Snap with you. It truly is an honor. All right, guys, remember, elephants suck apparently to Alex. And until the next one, happy snapping.